and my name is Michelle Cook. I am a technical assistant and content specialist with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, I'm a relatively new staff member here at Mid-Atlantic ADA. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today as today's moderator to Creating Welcoming Park Environments, Inclusion of Individuals with Mental Health Conditions, being presented by Dr. Gretchen Sneathan of Temple, the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Gretchen and to be working with her again um, as we have worked together in the past uh, during our educational careers. And it is a great thing to be with her once again and to have her presenting to you all today. Um, so without further uh, ado, I would love to introduce to you Dr. Gretchen Sneathan. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Gretchen Sneathan and I am with the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion. We are a national research and training center uh, that is also also funded by Neidler, um, that focuses on um, implementing research or conducting research that tries to better understand um, either factors that influence community participation of individuals who experience mental health conditions. Uh, we also develop and test interventions to really help facilitate independent um, community participation. So some of the things just to sort of frame the work that we do is that we believe um, strongly that community participation is a right and that individuals, um, regardless of ability or disability, should have the opportunities to participate in their community just like everyone else. And we also um, believe that community participation is a medical necessity and that opportunities to engage in, their, in the community um, have, a, have the potential to uh, improve health and wellness, um, whether it's physical health or mental health. And so those are, those are some sort of frameworks that really guide the work that we do. And the, the work that I'm going to talk about today was informed by a project that we did with, um, it was one of our research projects almost seven years now, um, where we, we, we talked with individuals who experienced mental health conditions. We interviewed them to identify places in the community where they felt welcomed as a person with a mental illness. And specifically, we were looking for the types of locations that were mainstream so anyone can access them. We weren't looking for um, community mental health centers. We hope that people feel welcomed within those spaces, but we were really looking to identify those mainstream community locations where people felt welcomed and included. And not really surprisingly, but, but one of the places that, that came up over and over again was, was parks um, and recreation facilities. And, and there's a number of reasons why these came up. A lot of it was access to nature, the opportunity to come and go as you please, sort of the, the low expectations of, or the, I shouldn't say low expectations, the really no expectations of, of, um, required interaction. You can come, you can talk with people, you can come, you can sit on a bench, you can come with people, you can come alone. Um, sort of the flexibility of the space, but also the, the atmosphere that could facilitate walking or meditation or really the diversity of activities. And, and so we, we dug into this one a little bit more and we're, we're actually doing a series where we're um, developing some training material that focuses on the different types of locations and what um, providers or community members can do to be more intentional, uh, more intentional about um, increasing um, participation and access of individuals who experience mental health conditions. Michelle, what slide is this? Sorry. You are on slide 11. Gretchen. I'm on slide 11. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. And so, so this again is some, some additional framework. And when we talk about um, disabilities, we really come from a social model of disability um, perspective. And what that means is that the factors that are within the environment may create um, a disability, not so much the actual diagnosis of the individual. So for example, unwelcoming attitudes, physical barriers, uh, language or cognitive barriers, um, 
might be factors that that contribute to that social model of disability and the social exclusion exclusion is often common commonly accepted as what's best so think about things that may occur in parks that are not necessarily intentionally designed to exclude people but that may um, set up a precedence for exclusionary practices. So, for example, you could have programs that are designed for um, specifically for individuals who experience disabilities. And then the expectation is that people with disabilities will participate in those activities and people without disabilities will participate in the other activities. And so there's this intent. Well, there's this separation of individuals within spaces here in Philadelphia we had a program or a park called Carousel House, which has recently closed, um, which was a, a designated recreation facility that was designed to be accessible and the space for um, individuals who experience disabilities to go and participate and have opportunities for, for recreation and, and park participation. Uh, the problem is, is that it was in one location. It was, you know, Philadelphia is very large. It was somewhat difficult to access and it wasn't, you know, inclusive. Um, you know, it was often a, um, often tailored towards um, specific disabilities, not really all disabilities. And it, it also set up the opportunity where other parks and recreation facilities didn't feel like they needed to be inclusive because there was this opportunity elsewhere in the city. Um, and so on this slide, there is a, an image, um, it's somewhat decorative, but there is a person um, and uh, two arrows going in both direction with a community uh, which is designed to represent that disability is really an interaction between um, the person and their environment. And I will go to the next slide, which is slide 12, and I can see it this time. Uh, so one thing um, that is also important to, to talk about in, in, in thinking about the framing of this is that disability is really an aspect of diversity. And in the past few years, I mean, diversity and inclusion has certainly been something that is, is talked about, but it's really ramped up in its, its prevalence in conversations and in um, strategies to be more inclusive. Uh, and disability is one of those um, those populations that isn't always in the forefront of the conversation, but it is absolutely an aspect of diversity. And so disability and diversity initiatives really are focused on targets, targeting specific groups of people who have repeatedly experienced social exclusion. Um, dis disability initiatives are really rooted in civil rights movements. And I think it's important to note that 15% of the population experiences a disability and one in five experience a mental illness. And then the work that we focus on um, with Temple is really supporting individuals who have serious mental illnesses and roughly one in 25 um, people experience a serious mental illness. So I, I give these numbers simply to say that individuals with disabilities are prevalent in today's society. Um, and they are likely, uh, if they're likely already participating in these spaces and there are ways that you can um, be more inclusive and welcoming. Uh, and if they're not um, participating, then, then why is that? And why, um, what ways can you better connect with those individuals and help make sure that there are um, opportunities for participation? Hey, Gretchen, we had a question come in that might be good to address uh, in this section. Yeah. Um, this person says, thank you for speaking about this important topic. Do you include autism under mental health? Um, so our work doesn't typically focus on individuals with autism, but it does, um, if, you know, if you if you look at services, so service delivery is, is never clean cut. Um, there are often a number of individuals who experience autism um, and the more traditional serious mental illnesses, um, which, which we typically look at major depression, bipolar disorder, and um, uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Uh, and there, I mean, behaviorally, there are some characteristics that are similar. Um, I don't think it 
matters really from an inclusion perspective. Um, our work typically focuses on those, those serious mental illnesses, which are those three, um, three diagnoses. I hope, hope that answers and please feel free to, to follow up with other questions. And I'm moving to uh, slide 13. And I, I put this quote up here um, because I think it's important to, to think about in the framing of diversity and parks. Um, and it says, having diverse park users, people who go to the park that other people in your community can share a recognition of experience with communicates your values, a commitment to advocacy and allyship. The work that parks and recreation professionals do may be the center of the community, while the fabric of the community is every person within it, including people with disabilities and mental health conditions. And this is slide 14. And I, there are a couple of statistics up here, and it is... Um, this is from some of our work that has focused on identifying areas of participation and community participation that individuals with serious mental health conditions are interested in and would like to do more often. And what we've found, and the, the, ver the numbers from different studies do vary from, some, from study to study, but for the most part, they are pretty consistent. 72% uh, of individuals with serious mental health conditions identify going to a park as important to them, and 48% of those individuals uh, would like to go more often. And so what this tells us is that um, there's a need. There's a need for people to either receive direct supports uh, where they can access and use um, parks within their community, um, or there's a need for parks to be more intentional about ways to reach out, connect, and include individuals who experience mental health conditions. And I am moving forward to slide 15. And this section, I'm going to talk about some of the, the benefits of park participation as they relate to some of the needs that individuals um, with mental health conditions experience. And I frame it this way. Um, partly because um, actually when I've talked with, with park uh, professionals and you talk about sort of why this is important for people who experience mental health conditions, the reasons really aren't that different than what everyone else is going to parks for. Uh, but I think it's important to frame it in the way that, that, that park professionals and, and other members of the community can say, oh, that's just like me. And so, so I have some information here that talks about the, the research around the needs of the population and then the opportunity um, of, of parks to meet those needs. And so the first one that I talk about is um, sedentary behavior. And um, as many of us have this uh, have have shifted to working from home, um, we may have experienced ourselves that we are are more sedentary as our jobs have shifted to more computer based or screen based activities. Uh, we're not moving as much as as we used to, um, and this is also true for individuals with mental health conditions. They are less likely to meet the physical activity guidelines, um, and they are more likely to spend um, time in sedentary activities than their non-diagnosed peers. There was a study um, that found that individuals who are diagnosed with schizophrenia spend um, up to 20 hours in either waking or sleep behavior in sedentary activity. And that's, you know, that's a significant amount of time. Um, and the opportunity here is that parks provide opportunities for individuals to simply get out of the house. Uh, simply leaving your house and visiting a park provides the opportunity for what we call incidental activity. And then many parks also feature walking paths or fields, uh, which provide opportunities for, for participation in formal or informal physical activity. One of our recent studies did find that um, people who with mental illnesses who identify going out into their community um, and engaging in everyday activities, so going to the park, going to the grocery store, these general things, um, were more likely to um, meet the STEP guidelines, so the either the 7,500 or the 10,000, depending on whose recommendations you're looking at. Um, but they were more likely to, to have more steps just by going out into their community. Um, and they were also less likely to engage in sedentary activities. So, so one of our things that we really talk about and focus on is 
is simply getting out of the house and having these important destinations to go to uh, can be important for your physical health. Uh, we also know that individuals um, who experience mental health conditions are have greater loneliness and isolation um, than the general population. They, they typically have fewer friends and acquaintances, and they also are more likely to have um, friends and acquaintances that are tied uh, to the mental health center. And um, I think we've also, you know, we can relate this to, to pandemic times and the things that have happened more recently. Uh, we've all sort of experienced this need for social connection and these opportunities that um, on a daily basis we had to be around others um, were, were significantly diminished uh, with when shutdown orders were put in place. Uh, and parks really do provide an opportunity for people to be around others. They're, this could be an opportunity to meet new people, maintain friendships and relationships, or simply be near other people. Uh, Park-sponsored activities are one example, but also providing welcoming, providing a welcoming place doesn't have to be uh, complicated. So there are strategies that, that might um, encourage some social connections, and this could be adding extra seating in your park for people to meet um, and making sure that there's plenty of shade um, and covered areas. Really just designing spaces that are inviting and draw people in. And thinking about um, places that that give people the opportunity to, to be amongst others without necessarily um, coming with a group of friends. Um, one of the things that we found in our Welcoming Places research project is that people went to parks uh, to, with the intention of meeting new people. Um, they, wanted, they wanted the opportunity for social interactions and they felt that parks provided that opportunity. And I am moving forward to slide 17. And this slide talks about park benefits uh, around mental health and the needs um, might include symptoms of depression, uh, which uh, is characterized by persistent sad feelings and loss of interest in activities um, and people who experience depression and um, depression is itself its own diagnosis, but it's often a common symptom across different um, mental health diagnoses. Um, and they may not participate in their community as much as other people. And the opportunity, again, that, that parks have is that physical activity um, has been shown to significantly reduce levels of depression. And the good news is, is that does, this doesn't just mean um, high energy exercise. It can be light activity. So just going for a walk, um, natural environments and being outside can have health benefits. Um, and then the social connectedness opportunities that, that I just talked about also have, um, can have a positive, um, effect on depressive symptoms. And then for additional mental health benefits, um, I'm sorry, this is slide 18. Uh, and one area that is also impacted um, by mental health diagnoses is um, motivation, which is a part of your cognition and negative emotions that occur um, in relation to, to depression can lead to decreased effort and lower motivation. And then many individuals um, who experience mental illnesses spend their days primarily engaged in very passive activities like watching TV. Um, and these passive activities have also been associated with negative emotions and low motivation. And this is often very cyclical. So the more that individuals isolate, the more that they're separated from more engaging and interactive activities, the less likely um, people are to get out and engage in those activities. Activities. And so um, that and that motivation to change uh, your behavior uh, actually decreases. So this is somewhat of a cyclical um, relationship. And but parks do have an opportunity to address some of these motivation issues. Um, and some of this might be that engaging in pleasurable activities can increase motivation and um, Parks are often places where people want to go. And so the opp those opportunities can be a source of motivation. Again, social interactions and social commitments. So, so being committed to participate in a designated activity or um, being committed to a friend um, that, you've, that you've said you would go to a space with can also increase motivation. And then 
being intentional about providing a diversity of activities within a space um, can provide opportunities for individuals to meet and deepen social connections, which are key strategies to increasing motivation. And this slide, which is slide 19, um, features a gentleman. It is not a picture of a person from our uh, research study because we're not allowed to do that, but he's a gentleman in a blue striped shirt. He's smiling. He looks like he's outside uh, and he's wearing a hat. And uh, this is a lived experience spotlight. It is based on a conversation that occurred during the, the Welcoming Places uh, research project. And we've named him Aaron, which is not his real name, but it was a nice name, so we chose it. Um, Aaron visits his local park several times a week, uh, year round. He loves to sit on benches, people watch and let his mind relax. Because of his mental illness, he often feels uncomfortable and unwelcomed in public spaces. But according to him, everyone is welcome at the park. When he sits in the park, he feels no one's eyes are on him. They're all focused on their own lives. Parents play with their kids, animals roam around, teenagers play basketball, and he sits on his bench. Aaron says he feels safe at the park because there are so many people around. He has even fallen asleep in the shade on a nice day. He says a trip to the park is his vacation. So this is just an example of um, someone feeling welcomed and included in their local park. And I think it's important um, to note that, that in this example, Aaron is amongst people. He's with people. He feels connected to them without being really... Um, without intentionally socializing or interacting with them. And, and again, from some of our own research, we know that this is important. Being around people, um, particularly people that you might see on a daily basis, even if they're not people that you specifically know, can become what we call familiar strangers. And those individuals actually increase your feelings of social connectedness and your feelings of social support, uh, which are also very important predictors of health. And so this next section, um, we are on slide 20, uh, is called Welcoming Parks. And it is, um, it, we're getting into some of the recommendations that we came um, up with um, specifically for um, park professionals and also um, volunteers that may work within park environments. And I will also mention that when we put together this, um, these recommendations, and I also did not mention all of this is focused on a, um, we have a training and resource guide that is a, um, it's a resource for park professionals that is, is, this presentation, but in a much longer format. So this is kind of some of the highlights. Uh, and this is one of those sections. And it's really focusing on um, being intentional about your language and specifically avoiding discriminatory language. Uh, and and framing this is important. Um, this is slide 21, and it is about microaggressions. And these are frequently occurring subtle indignities and insults uh, that may be verbal or nonverbal and communicate negative discriminatory messages to people belonging to a specific group. Um, often these, well, sometimes they are intentional, um, sometimes they're not specifically intentional, um, but, but individuals with serious mental illnesses experience microaggressions, which are unique to a person's mental health status, as well as daily slights, uh, which have parallels to microaggressions based on a person's race, gender, and sexual orientation. And some of these might include assuming stereotypes, invalidating experiences related to a mental illness, um, misusing language, or defining a person by their diagnosis rather than their the social roles that they occupy. And so Keep this in mind as you think about your interactions uh, directly with individuals. And, and remember that number, um, one in five adults experience a mental health condition and one in 25 um, experience a serious mental illness. So the likelihood is that you interact with individuals who experience mental health conditions, if not on a daily basis, relatively frequently. And so your language, even if you don't know um, the, their mental health status or whether or not they have a mental illness, the, the language that you're sharing or that you're representing um, might be a microaggression towards someone either you're directly communicating with or that might be um, in your immediate surrounding. 
And language su suggestions that we have is um, to use person first language. But the other comment is, is it ever necessary to reference the person's diagnosis? Typically it is not. Um, when you're working with groups who might come into spaces, think about um, how you communicate that. If there are a schedule that is communicated with staff, um, there may be opportunities where mental health um, groups are coming in. Um, and so there may be a, a section of the park that's reserved, or if there's a, um, for example, one of our, our local behavioral health centers would have a, uh, a fall picnic every year. And so they would reserve a section of their park. Is it necessary to say uh, Horizons Behavioral Health, or could you just say Horizons? Um, and because this is, communicating an opportunity where you have a group of individuals that are coming in, it's not likely necessary to communicate to everyone that this is a behavioral health program that's coming in. Really what needs to be communicated is that this is an opportunity um, or this is a space that's, that's occupied by an organization. Um, think about um, how, because, and, and I say this because if you have staff that are interacting uh, with those individuals who have made that reservation, they may interact differently knowing that they're coming into a space where these are um, service recipients or mental health service recipients versus just individuals who belong to this organization. Events uh, that you host might be uh, you might name them something just because it's it's uh, it's funny or it's catching. Um, a lot of times we will see around Halloween there are there are um, events that are themed around um, mental health or mental illnesses. Uh, things with terminology like psycho or uh, having events that are or, or spaces that are mimicking um, inpatient hospitals, particularly ones that aren't, you know, the, you don't have these spaces anymore. So having those types of activities uh, or events can be really uh, triggering for individuals and can also be very alienating. So think about how, um, how you're representing um, individuals who experience mental health conditions and what's that communicating, what is being communicated to the general public, but also to individuals who may experience those diagnoses. Uh, saying things using silly run versus crazy run. These are those runs where people are expected to act silly um, when they run. There might be challenges to do different things as you're going. So just thinking about how those are named. And then, and then really more important or just as important is the general conversations that you're having. Uh, think about your interactions with staff and volunteers and how they, how the language they use and how it might affect others around them. Terms like crazy nuts or junkie may be off offensive to patrons, staff, or other volunteers. So being intentional about the language that's being used and um, nicely uh, but firmly correcting uh, language that you don't want in the spaces that you're working. And this is a, I'm sorry, slide 23. This is a, a sign that we developed that really was designed to help you check your language and think about what you're saying. Uh, and it says that words matter. Ask yourself the following questions to ensure that your language is welcoming to people with mental health conditions. So number one here is, does my language perpetuate or diminish stereotypes? Examples of words that promote stereotypes are include psycho, crazy, nuts, wacko, and lunatic. Um, and one are or they can they which uh, one particularly harmful stereotype is equating violence with mental illnesses. So um, instead of saying the other thing that the other thing that this this image does is it says instead of saying I don't work with mentally ill people because they're lazy, try saying something like I like working with collaborative uh, with a collaborative productive team. So think about what you're communicating with with the words that you're saying. The second one is does my language evoke pity? Pity suggests that the person may be suffering, be a victim, and isn't able to manage their condition much less like live, must, much less, I'm sorry, live in the community just like everyone else. So instead of saying something like people suffering from mental illnesses, try saying people with mental health conditions. Um, and again, I would uh, strongly encourage you to think about why you need to disclose that individuals might have a mental health condition within the spaces that you're in. 
Uh, and then am I misusing, number three is am I misusing mental health terminology? Uh, using mental health diagnoses as descriptors for everyday events and validates the experiences of people who have those conditions. So instead of saying something like, uh, the weather is so bipolar today, um, try saying something like, I didn't expect it to rain, or one minute it's raining and then the sun comes out. So, so thinking about how um, those words that, that may have slipped into our everyday vernacular uh, may not be appropriate in describe and, and may be actually offensive to people that were around. Gretchen, we've got a request. Yes. Could you um, demonstrate or give us an example of how you would nicely but firmly correct somebody's language? <laughs> well, and this, this sometimes depends on the relationship that you have with the person. Um, or as I've learned, um, in, <laughs> I live in Philadelphia, I grew up in the Midwest. So my nicely but firm um, does not always come naturally to me, but I, <laughs> I've shifted it as I've lived here for quite some time. I think, you know, if you hear, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I, you know, if you hear, oh, that person, if, if it's a staff member talking about another staff member or a friend, oh my goodness, Jerry is so bipolar, you know, one minute he's here and attentive and the next he's just, you know, off chasing ducks. My response would be, particularly if I had a reason to be in the conversation would be, you know, I appreciate that you're frustrated with Jerry, Jerry's, um, you know, hmm. I appreciate that you're frustrated with Jerry's um, moving about the space when you need him to be in one place. Please don't use terms like bipolar because it doesn't really describe what you're concerned about. So, so the things that I would say is um, mention the, the characteristic or the behavior that is the, the issue, but use the words that actually describe it. So this, in this scenario, and it's probably not the best because I really just made it up. Um, the concern was that, that Jerry is, they can never find him. He's sometimes he's all over the place, uh, which we've all worked with people. Sometimes this happens, but describing it as bipolar is not, uh, is not effective. It doesn't really communicate anything about the behavior and it doesn't really communicate anything that can be resolved. Um, so thinking about using better descriptors versus using language that, that might be offensive. Does that help? Is that a useful example? That makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Some of these may not, I'm, I'm not always good at coming up with examples on the fly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very similar to, to when people use, um, use the R word um, and they say things that are, that are offensive. And I, I think it's, it's, it's fine to just be direct and say, please don't use that word. It's offensive. Is this what you're trying to communicate? And I will go to the next one. Uh, and this is slide 24. And it is um, talking about uh, universal design. And universal design is certainly not a, um, it's not something that we came up with. It is, a, you know, an ideal design that is meant to be inclusive of um, all people. Uh, so slide 25, which is what this slide is, is uh, talks about the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Um, there are seven features of universal design and these often include equitable use, flexibility, uh, the spaces should be simple and intuitive, uh, the information should be perceptible, there should be a tolerant, uh, uh, there should be a tolerance for error, uh, which that means if, if there are mistakes, um, it should kind of be absorbed within the space. So for example, if you are walking on a path there should and you, you know, you end up, um, let's say I was walking with my husband, we were walking in the woods, we were hiking and he was convinced that this was a circular path. 
I was not so convinced that it was a circular path. And we, um, there was not much tolerance for error because what happened was we did end up coming out of the woods, but we came out of the woods about a mile and a half on a road um, from where we parked. So our opportunity was to either go all the way back through the woods or to walk on the road, on the road for a mile and a half. So, which is, is what we did because we were not in an overly familiar um, space. So a strategy to address that and to provide some tolerance for error would be, you know, greater signage that would have you know, told us we were going into the, 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 the beyond um, or having some signs or having um, opportunities to turn back where, where trails could have led back or cut through. And, you know, this is obviously a, a kind of an extreme example um, but thinking that about that on a smaller scale where you can, where patrons can make mistakes and it, it doesn't, it really impact their experience within the space. Um, participation should require low physical effort or the amount of effort that people want to expend. Um, and then the size and the space is appropriate. Um, size and space for, for approach and use is appropriate for use. Um, so you, you, it's approachable and it is, is usable for the, the, the quantity and quality of activities that are occurring there. So um, as uh, this is slide 26, and as I'm talking about some of the ways that equitable use, um, or I'm sorry, that some of these things might be considered when you're thinking about individuals who experience mental health conditions. And uh, often when we think about universal design, it's, it's funny because often when we think about universal design, we think about uh, ways that individuals who might experience physical disabilities uh, would access the space and, and use it equitably as someone without physical disabilities. But I think it's important to also consider um, individuals who may have learning differences, individuals who may experience um, social anxiety, uh, or other mental health conditions, or um, have um, cognitive disabilities. And this is where, if you're thinking, you know, I, I'm coming from an expertise of working with individuals who experience mental health conditions, but a lot of these factors might, um, might be strategies to think about for including individuals who have, uh, have those disabilities that are less visually noticeable. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not just about people who use wheelchairs. It's also thinking about really the, the diversity of abilities and disabilities that people may experience. Um, and some of that is also thinking about the, the societal st and structural barriers that people may have. And so, and when I say structural, I don't, I don't mean those physical um, barriers, but structural like, um, uh, inability to access spaces um, because you don't have access to uh, reliable transportation or um, being on low income um, because, you know, you're, you're relying on disability income and having limited access to recreational activities uh, because of it. So what we do know that individuals who experience mental illnesses, and this is often true of individuals with disabilities broadly is that these are often people who are living in poverty. Um, they're either relying on part-time jobs or disability income. And so making sure that there are opportunities for free or low cost activities within your park um, and avoid having things that are, are expensive or having opportunities where there are a sliding fee structure and being sure that you communicate that those um, opportunities are available. And then also prioritize uh, activities geared towards adults. Uh, and, and I think this one is important because often when we think about parks and we think about recreation activities, we think about uh, organized activities that are designed to support um, kids and youth, and we forget about um, designing activities that might be more accessible to um, adults. 
And I will be honest, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, we of course went to parks, but I didn't fully appreciate parks until I was an adult and I lived in a tiny apartment and I did not have access to my own green space. I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest where I had a backyard and we had these places that it it wasn't as important to me until I was an adult. And then, you know, having these spaces where I could just go sit on a park bench became really, really important. And so thinking about the things that adults might do and adults that maybe don't have a strong um, social group or they don't have, um, you know, the structure of family and kid activities going on, but providing opportunities that um, facilitate or promote social connectedness. Um, it could be sports, it could be games, um, but really opportunities for um, adults to participate in things as well as, as children. And I am on slide 27. And this is about thinking about flexibility of use and um, simple or intuitive use. And I think this is this is related to that last comment about having opportunities for adults, but recognizing and encouraging that a diversity of activities can, in, can occur in one space. So in, um, in the interviews that we had with individuals who, uh, when they talked about their welcoming places, they talked about the ability, regardless of where it was, they talked about the ability to do a number of different things. So people who talked about going to the library often talked about obviously reading books, but also accessing the internet, um, just having a quiet, cool place to go into, um, talking with uh, librarians that might have, you know, an interest or an expertise in a specific area, um, playing chess or being able to check out board games and, and play those kinds of things. So it was one location, but there were a lot of different things that could be done um, within the space. And so it met multiple needs of multiple users. And so I think not only making sure that parks have the ability to meet those diverse needs, but that those, um, those needs are, or those opportunities are well communicated. So participation should require really little to, or no instruction. Uh, so there should be opportunities, unless of course you're specifically coming to learn something new and then you might need some instruction, but you should be able to walk into a, a park facility or a space and say, oh, I can go over here and have a picnic or I can go sit on the bench here or look, there's some walking trails. So thinking about how signage might communicate uh, that information, or if there's a need for a staff member to sort of direct and tell people. Uh, but it, it really should be pretty intuitive um, and not uh, require um, extracting the information from somebody. And another thing to, uh, one of the other features would be um, uh, perceptive information, which is what slide 28 talks about. And this is uh, important information that is presented in a way that is accessible to all people and includes different modes of presentation, such as pictorial, um, verbal, and auditory. And so what that means in um, functionality is it's great to have a sign, but are there are there other ways that it could be communicated? So does your sign have an image that sort of indicates uh, what can happen in that space? Does it also have words? If you're in a diverse area, think about language that's also there. Um, are there opportunities to um, access the information uh, digitally? Can I get the information online before I attend the park or go into a space? Um, for people with anxiety, this might be really important because you can sort of, you can get the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, and you can also know what the expectations or the, the order of events might be. Um, and knowing that type of information might give uh, someone the ability and, and flexibility to make their plans so that they, they go in um, with their their best case scenario put forward, but they also have their backup plan. They've been able to plan their what ifs. And so for people experiencing high anxiety, this really may help them feel comfortable um, enough to engage in the activity. 
There's also opportunities to use um, either QR codes or um, phone in opportunities where you can call a number or, or a QR code could queue up some um, an auditory description. Um, I know here in Philadelphia, there are a number of um, statues and murals around and typically you can, there's a number next to it where you can call and, and learn more information about uh, that, that piece of art um, in the space. And so thinking about how that information is communicated and the different ways that someone might be able to access it uh, is, is really helpful. And I think this is not something as I mentioned, this isn't something just around, you know, can someone see, can someone hear um, type of information, but this really might be important in helping people process and plan for that participation. The other opportunity is to be intentional about sharing information with uh, local community health, mental health centers um, and um, taking the time to, to either send it directly to them or even better, taking an opportunity to reach out and say, hey, is there a time where I can come and share this information with your members? Um, and that may be a way to make that connection so that individuals are, they understand the opportunities that are available. And more importantly, they understand that those are opportunities are also for them. And I'm moving to slide 29. And this is another um, lived experience spotlight. And there's a image of a young woman sitting on a park bench. Um, it looks like it's cold because she has a purple sweater on and a, a shawl wrapped around her shoulders. And it also might be fall because it looks like the trees are yellow behind her. Uh, and, and her comment during our, our study was, um, take a walk in the park. They show movies there. They've got vendors there, free markets there. They've got volleyball there. They've got a lot of events going on. Uh, a lot of stuff going on out there. And I like, I like it there. And again, this speaks to the diversity of activities that might occur within spaces. And Michelle, I'm pausing just to see if there are any questions, because I think I am jumping to the next section. I'm not seeing any right now, Gretchen, I'll let you know. All righty. Uh, and this is slide 30. And these are some specific approaches that, that you might use um, to create welcoming parks. And one of these, and this was, um, this was an opportunity that, that was, uh, we saw in action here in um, Philadelphia, but I also know that these individuals um, are used in uh, New York City and in some of the, the urban parks that, that are around. Um, and they have staff or volunteers who are, their job is to, um, their job is really focused on including everyone in park activities. They may also enforce the rules um, that, that are set for the park, but really they're, they're designed to, these positions are designed to encourage interaction between park patrons and staff. And so these employees are um, there to facilitate gameplay. So, so in the park that is here locally, uh, they had a cart that would come out at certain times that had different board games um, or uh, um, like big Jenga. Um, so yard games, I guess those might be called or grouped. And they would invite people if they saw someone walking through and they weren't, you know, walking through quickly to go to a meeting, um, but they were sitting there, but not really engaging with anything. These people would invite them to come play a game or sit down and do something together. Uh, and they're really expected to serve as ambassadors for the park and they communicate the goals and really to engage park patrons. And so this is um, a way to connect with uh, individuals who are there, but really specifically make that connection and encourage participation, if not with other patrons, then with, um, with yourself and with the, the features of the park. Um, be intentional about advertising events. Um, and I, I will mention it again to share these with park pat patrons or mental health centers to facilitate conversations. And I mentioned this um, this in being intentional about reaching out to local mental health centers, because it's often um, 
we worked with a, a local mental health center and, and Philadelphia has a, a pretty large bike share program that um, is, is now, it's probably six or so years old now, but, but when we were doing this project, it was maybe only a year and a half, two years old. And the, this mental health center was located in downtown Philadelphia. There were bike stations all over. And there was one that was within a block of the the front door of this mental health center. And I remember talking with individuals and telling them um, that we were going to run, facilitate this group that really encouraged and supported people to use the bike share program. And they said, oh, those blue bikes. I said, yeah, those blue bikes, you might've seen them. I can use those. Those are for me. And so there was this, this disconnect that while this was a resource for the general community, and actually Philadelphia has been pretty intentional about um, creating a bike share program that is um, financially accessible. Um, they, the, this was a group of individuals who did not realize uh, that they were able to access, they didn't know how, but they didn't, they just didn't realize that they could access um, the bikes and use them just like everyone else. So taking the time to uh, send a staff member or have an ongoing conversation with um, a staff member at a mental health agency to let them know what opportunities are happening, send over the, you know, the movie in the park schedule and, and saying everyone is welcome, um, really can open the door to conversations about needs, conversations about things that that might help facilitate participation, but it also just shares that these things are happening and that individuals can come um, to those locations. And then, you know, making sure that there is inclusive signage. Um, so making sure that your signage and your advertisements represents a wide variety of ages, genders, races, and abilities, um, and including language that might be beneficial to the general public, but also might um, speak to someone who experiences a mental health condition. So saying something like take a walk for your mental health. If I know that I um, have issues with mental illness or I experience depression and I see that, I might think hmm, maybe that'll be good for me or this, this sign is really speaking to me or having information that talks about the specific health benefits, um, knowing that nature and physical activity can reduce symptoms of depression. This could be a partnership between parks and rec and um, local public health agencies that really um, encourage park participation for those health benefits. And another strategy or thing to focus on is, um, being intentional about including diverse stakeholders. And what that means is um, don't always just talk to the echo chamber and make sure that there are opportunities in your planning process that, that really elevate positive changes um, that you are intending to make in your parks and target representation of individuals um, from all backgrounds. Um, and you know, our recommendation is also to specifically include individuals who might experience mental health conditions to, um, to make sure that their voices are heard and that as there are changes that occur within um, park facilities, that you are being intentional about the needs that they have and making sure that, they, that, that there are opportunities that specifically connect with their needs. And so having increased representation, um, increasing engagement efforts and outreach, and then in increasing your community presence through organization partnerships. So think about opportunities where you might um, interface directly with um, community mental health centers. If you offer, uh, if something that frequently occurs within your community are um, walks for health or fundraiser walks, um, ask the local mental health centers if they have any of their own walks that are planned. Are there ways that you can support those activities? Um, so really just try to open the dialogue to, to show that you're, you're welcoming and inclusive of their needs um, and open to partnerships um, that might um, grow into more diverse and meaningful relationships. 
and this is slide 22. So some of the um, action steps that you might, might take um, to including diverse stakeholders might be to include disability information in your recruitment materials. Um, again, reach out to your city's Department of Behavioral Health or um, Public Health Center. Um, and then the next step with that would be to also reach out directly to those community mental health centers that might be um, in, in the neighborhood. So, you know, it's, it's one thing as a large parks and rec um, entity within, within the city um, or, or uh, yeah, so parks and rec within the city to reach out to the Department of Behavioral Health. But those are very high level interactions. Um, be intentional about connecting directly with mental health agencies, especially if those um, mental health agencies are, are directly connected to, um, uh, not connected to the park, but in the same neighborhood as parks. Um, develop and disseminate a community survey and make sure that you are providing opportunities for all community members to complete the survey. Uh, I know a number of mental health centers will have um, what they call community meetings. And so these are opportunities where um, community members uh, or individuals who might have things going on that might be of interest to the members at the, at the agency can come in and talk about uh, resources or opportunities available. And it provides, um, provides you with an opportunity to, to dialogue and, get, um, and gather information from those individuals and then share your agenda uh, with others. And so, so let people know this can be agenda on multiple levels, let people know that these are the activities that are occurring, but also if there are intentions to, um, provide more opportunities for physical activity, if that is a community wide goal, share it with individuals who might need to know it. Um, so some of these agendas might be things that are coming up within the space and how you can um, be intentional to invite um, or gather input from those individuals. And uh, Michelle, I see there's a number one on the Q&A. Is there a question? Hey, Gretchen. Yeah, there is a question um, and I'll, I'll open it up to you, um, but I also have my own thoughts on the issue if you'd like me to add them. Sure. Um, so the question is, do you know if there is a technical assistance center for inclusive parks? I don't know specifically, you might know that. Um, <laughs> we, so, so I will say from, from our own perspective with, um, with the collaborative, we, we do provide training and technical assistance. We have worked with some um, community park agencies specifically as it relates to um, being inclusive and connecting with community mental health centers. But, but I would say we are not specifically, you know, that's not our, our only goal. And I would answer that question very similarly as well. While parks is not our sole focus within the ADA National Network, um, our centers nationwide, which will put the information back up for um, how to communicate with within the network, how to get in touch with us for technical assistance. Um, you know, we, uh, the staff of the the centers nationwide are willing, able, ready to answer your questions related to accessible programming and inclusive programming in parks. Um, I will offer this tiny tidbit of advice, though, that it is a benefit to everyone, and I think Gretchen's probably highlighted it a couple of times in this, in this presentation already, a benefit to all to think about how you might accommodate various needs at the planning stage and not try and address them retroactively in like an emergency situation <laughs> where you don't know um, you know, you're scrambling to try and figure out what to do. So ask your questions, have that healthy curiosity, reach out to the network um, or the TU Collaborative, who, whoever um, you're most comfortable uh, communicating with about those needs. Um, always think about it during the planning process. It works out better for everybody. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, this isn't maybe your question, but I know a number of, of community organizations have have tried to be more welcoming and inclusive of individuals with mental health conditions. And, and their first step is to have everyone go through a mental health first aid training. And there's benefit to it. Uh, 
but it sort of puts the expectation that you're going to be interacting with people who might be in crisis and you want to support them. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that is, of course, you know, a, a great resource for the community. And, and you want to be able to, to react and support people who might be in their time of need. Um, but for the most part, um, the interactions that you have with individuals um, who might experience mental health conditions, you are not going to know um, that they're experience that they have a mental health condition. Um, and so making sure that the space is as welcoming and inclusive as possible um, takes steps that are not necessarily focusing on mental health first aid or are in addition to um, activities like mental health first aid. And this is um, slide 33. And this is about um, some ideas or strategies that are more direct com connections with mental health service users. And these might include, um, these actually really, the idea is establish a relationship. Um, don't just be the park around the corner, but have a conversation, um, you know, have an ongoing conversation with not only the agencies, but, but really try to have direct conversations with these service recipients themselves. Um, again, this might include strategies like pr providing information and resources, um, we recently released a resource on park prescriptions. Uh, we did not come up with the idea of park prescriptions, but we love it uh, because it is, well, one, it's kind of a catchy title, but it also um, really speaks to the need of using your community resources, parks specifically, to address um, health concerns that you might have. So, um, for example, if uh, you know, if you're considering um, park prescriptions, and these don't have to be just uh, like prescription. I know that the nature prescription activities are sometimes partnered directly with um, medical providers, which is great. Um, but you can also work with um, volunteers, or you can provide an opportunity in your park where you have a staff member or a volunteer who's meeting with park patrons to talk about their um, their health needs, um, and their, their desires for whether it's increasing physical activity, increasing social connectedness. Um, I need to be more, I need to have more cognitive, like diversity, um, in the things that I'm doing. Um, so, so having people talk through some of their, their needs and then matching them with opportunities that might occur within park spaces. So if people are saying, I'm feeling very isolated, well, we have a number of opportunities where you could come and connect with your local community members. We have a farmer's market, we have, um, you know, book readings, whatever it might be, but, but really listening to the things that people are, are, wanting and needing in terms of connection and um, health related goals and connecting those to the opportunities that might occur within your park system, I think can be a really meaningful opportunity um, to have a conversation, but also support people and help them to recognize that the park is a resource that they can use and access to improve their own health. Um, talk with people again, talk about, um, barriers that they may have to park participation. Hey, why don't you come to this park? It's right around the corner from the mental health agency. Oh, well, I went there one time and had this really negative experience or, um, you know, there's, uh, there's not a, I don't know how to get there without going on this really busy street, whatever it might be, but talk with people to try to understand what the barriers to park participation may be. And then what factors that you could incorporate into your planning um, or structure within the park that might facilitate uh, participation and relieve some of those barriers. Be intentional about offering your space. So oftentimes um, when meetings happen, they will occur within the mental health center. Um, this might be an opportunity, particularly if you're local to say, hey, 
we have this uh, pavilion or we have this space where if you're having some of these organized activities, please come use this space. We really want to have this partnership. Um, and then identify where there might be pure respites in your communities. Pure respites are places where um, they're not inpatient facilities, but they are spaces where people who need respite um, can go, they can connect with other individuals who might experience mental health conditions. Um, and they, they're often, they're places where people go when they're not in crisis, but they feel like they need some extra support. So connecting with those peer respite programs, if there are any in your community, and let them know that parks are a great resource when people are needing to feel connected and needing some space for um, restorative engagement or whatever it might be, but letting, letting those peer respite programs know that, that these individuals and the people that they support are welcome um, to come and use those park facility and resources. There are a couple of comments in the uh, Q&A. So one is uh, from Jim, Jimini, uh, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Um, the, um, she wanted to remind us that all Title II entities, and that includes parks and rec departments of state and local governments, <clears throat> excuse me, are required to assign an ADA coordinator. Um, and those coordinators should ensure that accessibility notices and contact info are on, our, are on all communications put out by the entity on the website, et cetera. Um, they must also have a grievance policy and public notices posted on their website. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and that is a really good source of information um, for inclusion in parks as well is your, your ADA coordinator um, who should know what's going on. And then uh, the question that came in was, um, this person is, is wondering if there are any things to consider from a physical space standpoint. Um, such as colors to avoid or lean towards size of indoor spaces, considerations for echo or loudness of indoor spaces, the light quality, et cetera, relative to um, users with mental health needs. Sure. You know, and, and, so, and some of this is, there's always going to be variation. What we did find though, consistently when talking with individuals who, who experience mental health conditions about their places where they felt welcomed, um, there was often, um, uh, access to natural light. So, you know, if there are opportunities for windows, I think that that is always preferred. Um, there were, spaces that, that, um, weren't so, so if it was, if it was a loud space, um, there were places that you could go that might be quieter within that space. So that's kind of the idea of having that flexibility within space. If you're in something that is, is loud, knowing that, um, if you, if that is overstimulating or something that causes anxiety, being able to, or knowing where you could go, um, to experience some quiet or just to get away from it for a little bit, I think is, is helpful for, for individuals. Um, color wise, there actually has been some research, not specifically for parks, um, but in, um, in actually in designing mental health, uh, centers and the types of spaces that are considering considered more welcoming. And it, you know, it was natural tones. It was greens, it was blues. Uh, those, the colors that sort of mimic nature were more calming, I guess. Um, and I think that that's generally what's recommended, recommended for, um, hospital type spaces. Uh, and then in terms of, um, with furniture, uh, there has been some research that talks about like flexible seating options and, and, and things that can be, um, moved to some degree, not necessarily easily, but you can, if, if the furniture is somewhat modular, you can create spaces that are encouraging conversation, or you can also separate and have, have your own space. So those are, those weren't specifically from, from our research or conversations about parks, but that is kind of generally the, the architectural design um, literature that's out there on um, welcoming environments um, for people who experience mental health conditions. And um, this is slide th 34. And this is, this is my, uh, 
I guess my ideal in an ideal world, I would love to see this happen more often. So um, there are a, a set of service professionals who are called peer support specialists. And these are individuals who have um, personal experience of a mental health condition. They are typically hired by mental health agencies and they serve as um, peer professionals where they are working, um, directly alongside others who have, um, mental health conditions. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for sharing, um, common experiences, talking about their own experience of having a mental health diagnosis and navigating different spaces. Um, if there are opportunities where parks and recreation professionals can reach out directly to those peer providers, it's a very great way to um, communicate that you're open um, and willing to, uh, to welcome these individuals into your park spaces. Um, but having that conversation with peers is often a very direct way to get people included and participating in your space. I would love to see parks hire peer support specialists um, where they, uh, particularly peers who value parks and, and have um, recognized parks as important in their own recovery journey. Um, but having a, a peer support specialist on staff who could actually do some of this connecting with uh, community mental health centers, um, I think would, would go leaps and bounds um, in making spaces feel welcoming and inclusive. It also provides opportunities for um, bringing in uh, the voice of someone who has a, a lived experience and they can also help think more diversely about um, ways to be inclusive and ways to connect to, to individuals who experience mental health conditions. Um, another thing that, that we've actually recommended and we've done in the past is we've worked with um, Parks and Rec and other community organizations to host um, a physical activity fair or a park fair. Uh, and what this is, is it's very similar to a, a conference or um, uh, why am I blanking on a convention, I guess would be, uh, be the other term for it, where you bring in the vendors are all local um, resources. It could be parks and rec. It could be um, here. It might be bike share. Uh, we had the library come in because they also offer a number of um, activity opportunities. Um, but having all of these diverse providers from the community come into one space and then inviting um, community mental health centers to bring their own members uh, to, to learn about the opportunities in your community and to, um, you know, you can have a mix of stations where people can connect with those, those activities or opportunities. You can have live sessions where you're leading, um, you know, it might be yoga, you're leading different physical activity groups, um, and then having individuals who might meet one-on-one -on -one with, um, uh, participants to do an individualized planning um, or that park prescription activity where you can talk about um, the types of activities that they're interested in and then match them with opportunities that might be available within the community. And so these are just some strategies that, that really um, are very intentional with making those connections and trying to facilitate uh, inclusion um, of individuals with um, mental health conditions within your spaces. And this is slide 35, and it is, I believe, our last lived experience spotlight, and it features, there's a couple, um, they look to be older, uh, walking across a bridge. Um, there's a gentleman wearing a jacket, and they actually, well, the woman, man and woman, they're both wearing a jacket. Uh, the woman's wearing a dress or a skirt, and gentleman is wearing what looks like a uh, sports coat um, and pants and they're smiling and walking across this bridge. Um, and the lived experience spotlight is for an individual participant named James. And what he said about the park is it's like I've found safety in the park, a sense of belonging without being discriminated against. And so, you know, I chose to end with this because I think it's a great reminder that this is a, that parks are often a place where people feel like they belong and connected and they, they feel like they're able to go into a space without being judged. 
And that is, this is, a, I guess, slide 36. It is, if you have any questions um, or discussion, I am here to answer questions. I have a little wooden guy with a question mark above his head. Um, and I've also put our website on the, the slide, which is www.tucollaborative.org. And if you go onto our website and you click on the resources tab and then click on um, recreation and leisure, there are a number of resources. Um, in addition to the welcoming parks environments, there's a number of resources that are related to um, supporting people to participate in recreation and leisure activities. So Gretchen, thank you so much for your presentation. We do have a couple of comments or questions uh, in the chat. And while I'm going through those, just wanna invite um, others on the call who wanna ask their questions to locate that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can submit questions uh, to that window as we're, as we're going through and wrapping up today. Um, the first question was, has anyone heard uh, or ever heard of providing a recorded place-based walking meditation? Um, and I'm not just going to pose that question to you, Gretchen, but also invite others on the call um, if you have resources of that nature to share them in the chat for everyone. So, but turn I am, it over to you, Gretchen, if you're aware I, of anything. I am not, but it's a cool idea. And I, it would be, I think, relatively easy to, to, to facilitate and and you could do a you know if you're walking on a trail you could have sort of a winter you could select one if it's winter select two if it's spring so you could kind of tap into maybe the different seasons that would be going on but that that would be fantastic Awesome. And then we have a, uh, a reminder and a recommendation from a participant that uh, to reach out to your, um, whether your district or department has a therapeutic recreation specialist on staff. Um, don't forget to connect with those professionals during design, programming, training, et cetera. Um, they can also likely connect you to other community resources as well. And um, speaking for the two rec therapists on the, the call, uh, we say thank you to, for that uh, recommendation. Yes, and a num number of the activities that, that I referenced. Um, so I am affiliated with Temple University. We have a recreational therapy program. And so we've been able to, you know, make some of these things happen by working directly with our, our undergraduate program um, to help facilitate some of these things. Excellent. And there is uh, one last comment in there right now that is uh, saying that there are a few places in the Midwest region, um, in particular, that have set up labyrinths in their parks uh, for the purpose of place-based uh, meditation, walking meditation. Um, so you might seek those out. Cool. At the moment, I am seeing no further questions. So Gretchen, I'm going to ask you to advance to the next slide for me. Slide 38, and this is the thank you for joining us slide. Um, our contact information for the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, our toll-free number is there on the screen, that's 800-949-4232, or our local direct number is 301-217-0124. You can contact us via email at adainfo at transcend.org or on our website at adainfo.org. There was one more resource left in the chat, so I'll read that aloud for everyone to benefit. Um, there, uh, check out Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, uh, about the recorded walking trail. So check that out. Let me get a chance. I'm copying it so I can do that. <laughs> I'm very curious. Awesome. I want to thank everybody uh, for their questions today, uh, for a lively and engaging session. Um, and thank you again to our presenter, Gretchen, Dr. Gretchen Sneven. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you.